face anytime. Why you guys are so far away? Oh my God. Why are you sitting in the moon? <laughs> yeah, because of the discussion too. Okay. okay, so first of all, I'll begin by acknowledging that we are meeting in indigenous stolen people's lands. Uh, secondly, I want to also today uh, specifically recall that today is the 50th anniversary of the massacre against Mexican students at the university where at least we know 500 students were killed, many imprisoned and disappeared. This is uh, very, I sent it to some of the students, the students in the class, I send you article, but there is a lot. I've been actually like reading and reading more and more. And I think it's very relevant to what we are doing. I want to also, uh, we will discuss that, and I think there is a big connection between uh, what happened in Mexico and also our discussion about the Chicano Chicana movement. Uh, not because it's, on, it's only the same ethnicity, but all sorts of black people are the same. It's not a blood issue. It's not a DNA issue. It's about connections and struggles together. The class is about comparative border studies, Palestine and Mexico. So we are, sometimes we focus more on Palestine, sometimes we focus more on Mexico, but we're always trying to draw the connections between Palestine, Mexico, other places where borders, boundaries, indigenous struggles are going on, oppression and theft of land. So this is kind of like thinking about, it's not just the wall, it's not the wall of death and the apartheid wall that are being built. Uh, so we to always think about what does history mean. Next week we are going to have uh, Professor Blanca Mise here, and she is actually going to give us a history of uh, Spain, of the Spanish Civil War, 1936-39, and also of the struggle of Catalonia. You know, yesterday was the first anniversary of the referendum, and of the Basque. As you know, all of it was connected because Guernica was bombed during the Spanish Civil War. So hey. It's <laughs> okay. hi, hi. So it's, uh, we are going to have a discussion and we're going to ask, and part of the reason is not because Spain is the mother empire, it's because this is something that actually history is that we need to understand. And next week I also want to talk about 1936-39 revolt in Palestine because it was happening exactly around the same time as the Spanish. So what did we understand about all these legacies of oppression, of histories, how can we compare histories we don't want to conflict. Not every, every context is the same, and things are not exactly the same. But we want to think about all of this stuff. What does it mean? The other thing, the other two things that I wanted to mention is that tomorrow we are in the, here in, in the other class, in the Palestine course at 7 o'clock. We are also honored to have four of the strikers, of 1968 strikers. You know, we're marking the 50th anniversary too. So it would be really interesting to have a discussion. What does the, the, the struggle of the Mexican students in Mexico mean and the demands that they put out as a free speech, um, free speech, uh, a halt to state violence, accountability for police and military abuses, release of political prisoners. It's very, very interesting how this, a lot of the stuff is actually overlapping with the things that we're uh, thinking about and, and learning about. So they will be speaking, and it's also very much connected all of these events to our project teaching Palestine, pedagogical practice and the indivisibility of justice and the connecting with, we've been doing all these uh, collaborations with Palestinian universities, with many, and we will continue talking about it. It's also about what does it mean to commemorate and think about anniversaries that have happened, whether we talk about anniversaries of struggle or anniversaries of massacre, anniversaries of oppression, what does this mean? What do we think about that and so on? So that's just tomorrow. Next Monday, uh, there is the Indigenous Film Festival that is happening at the uh, 518 in Valencia as well as the Roxy Theater, and it's going to be moderated by Bill Means, who is a founding member of the American Indian Movement. Uh, Madonna Thunderhawk is coming from Standing Rock, and she's one of the major women warriors. Uh, film on women warriors is going to be shown uh, next week, and also there will be two films on Palestine. One of them is on the young Palestinian woman who's been imprisoned and released, Ahed Tamimi, and another one about Palestinian children meeting from different refugee camps, and so on. And they've actually asked us, the American Indian movement, for the films themselves, and they included them because they believe that this is part of the indigeneity. That's on the eighth. It's on the Indigenous People's Day. Of course, there isn't one day that's Indigenous People's Day. All the time. All the time it should be that. Because our country is here. And then we have uh, next, uh, so next week is going to also be the the uh, the, the span the Spanish, uh, and I'm also trying to find somebody from Kashmir to actually give us a discussion about the wall that India is building, the oppression, the question of political prisoners, the question of you know the, like the Indian soldiers that actually been shooting a line of people and specifically organizers and so on. There is a lot of, but we couldn't get to it. 
fix the time. So we'll figure out how we do it. We can do it this semester. We'll do it next semester. We'll keep you posted. And finally, on uh, two other things, on October 25th at uh, the Eric Casada Center, 518 Valencia, we are actually collaborating with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. And we are doing a big event about pri prison incarceration. And this is also members of the people who were on the delegation, the first prison soldier delegation to Palestine in 2016. And we're going to be showing the slideshow and having a discussion thinking about how do we continue. And this is also part of teaching Palestine. And then finally, on November 1st, is the anniversary of the Palestinian mural. And that will be in Jack Adams Hall. And this year's the mural is going to be focusing on Jerusalem. The Jerusalem, what's happening in Jerusalem, the various images. So keep all of this in mind. We keep reminding you, come tomorrow. And without further ado, I want to welcome Claude Marx, who is a friend, a brother, a comrade, the co-founder of the Freedom Archives, uh, one of the makers of this film, as, fil as well as another film that I will show in my part is Contemporary 101 Camp and Intelligence Program. And there's all these movements that we're going to promote. <coughs> and I'm not going to talk because you will be talking about it. But Claude also was a co-organizer of the prisoner delegation to Palestine, a former prisoner himself, a long time fighter for and also really important to think about freedom archives and the ways in which we are trying to have an intergenerational conversation. Because between those of us who are much older of that day of generation and those of you who are much younger to be able to think about how do we what, what lessons exist, what histories do we know, how do we pass on the legacies, how do we interact, what sort of struggles exist in any particular. So all of this is part of it. So I'm going to turn it over to Claude and to say a couple of things before we start the film and then okay, thank you so much. Um, and it's being streamed by Thank you all for for uh, being here, of course. Um, not just because you're enrolled, but I'm always happy when people are down to view um, uh, to view something that we've worked very hard on. Um, I think the film kind of speaks for itself, but it also represents a different kind of politic about the issue of Chicano Mexicano existence. Um, particularly pay attention, I would say, I would suggest to the fact that there's really two waves of colonialism, of settler colonialism, that the film addresses. Um, obviously, we respect the indigenous people who held this land well before Europe got to the Western Hemisphere, but also were additionally in occupied northern Mexico. Um, and the film is addressing that question. And even though it focuses on Colorado and northern New Mexico, um, really this film represents an attempt to like resurrect the importance, the centrality, and the young people who organized and were martyred in the course of the emergence of um, Chicano Mexicano, Chicana Mexicana struggle in the early 70s. And so I'll leave it at that. I may step out because I've seen the movie plenty. <laughs> um, but I will come back in before it ends. And then um, I'm totally interested in what you have to say about it and, and a conversation that can go wherever wherever you want to take it. And then uh, Professor Abdelhadi and I will try to negotiate that. But really, I, my interest is in where your heads are at afterwards. So that's cool. And maybe uh, we can just do a very a light quick thing? light of a uh, round of introductions so people can just say their name. And mine sure. are there in the class or attending, just so, yeah. So. Sure. Why don't we start here? Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. My name is Ricky. I will, are, you, are you in the class or you're at Yeah, I'm in the class. You're in the class. Okay. Ricky, what's your last name? Uh, Macias. Oh, okay. Hey everyone, Alejandro Um I'm in the class and I'm a third year journalism student, uh, Fijian film. Uh, my name is Emily. Um, I'm a senior and a women and gender studies major and I'm in the class as well. Um, my name is Carissa. Uh, I'm a physics major and I'm in the class. My name is Stephanie Ortega. I'm uh, majoring in Latino studies and I'm also minoring in Ahmed. 
Uh, I'm Jonathan Jimenez, I'm majoring in Latino and Latino Studies, I'm in the class. I'm Ashley Swatter from, what's your name? Ashley Swatter, uh -huh. and I'm in the class as well. I'm Bella, I'm in the class. My name is Tamara, I'm an LTNS major, I'm in the class. Yeah. Okay, oh, my name is Cicely, um, and I'm in the class. My name is uh, Rogelio Roger, or, or Roger. I'm a sociology and a Latino ex major, and um, I'm not in the class, but I'm here to support. Oh. Uh, I'm Layla. I am not a student here, but I am one of Dr. Labrahadi's uh, assistants and interns. interns. And um, I'm just here to support. It's going to be a really interesting movie, so I'm excited. Ariana, she, her, hers, uh, again, Abdelhadi's intern, and I'm live streaming, so. Uh, my name is Hani Levy, I'm not in the class, but uh, I'm an honorary <laughs> member. Okay, thank you all By virtue of relationships. Uh, <laughs> all sorts of. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. We can stop the stream and stop the thing. And I'm going to reserve my comments, because this is what we do in the class. Students first go around and say how you feel about the film. What you, um, what do you, do you think? What uh, some of your re reaction? Each person gets one. And then we go around, and then we can have another round. So everybody gets to participate. Then everybody is going to participate. So don't think that some people can actually get off because I will embarrass people <coughs> and make you speak. So we can start with Bella, since you've only been used to my style. Yeah. So you're not really scared. So. Um, I'm Bella. Um, so, uh, about the film, can you introduce yourself? Did you introduce yourself? Yeah, I can introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the history, Mexican American history, is very important. Um, I think really unpacking um, that, that timeline is to like the experience of being here. Um, I like in just in the US, you know, in the United States. Um, there was some kind of like issues I had a bit that was with some of the narratives that are being told. I think that it changes through generation because we learn a lot a different kind of discourse um but yeah like being being mexican myself and being in the u.s it's um i i i don't agree with the whole idea of like upslan and um you know that uh, <coughs> that like just explain yeah yeah what well, is upslan I'm and what do you understand to be well, somebody says something, let's not assume that everybody Yeah, yeah. So when I think about slang, I feel like it's a erasure of actual indigenous native people of the US and it kind of just it, it's kind of just, you know, Mexico saying like this was our land and it wasn't, you know, this was a project that it's true that the US and Mexico worked together to create the mestizaje to you know, promote a greater kind of race that's not just fully indigenous. Um, I mean, yeah, I just feel like it's a it's a huge issue with with claiming that's land and it's erasure for sure. But but I do like the the stories being told. You know, some things that we continuously see is police brutality and. Um, injustice for a lot of murders that are being held that aren't being people aren't being held accountable for them especially race you know the the whole races are still alive now like it hasn't changed and I think it's important to continue with this narrative of um, knowing knowing that this is like they were saying you know this is still the history like this is still what we're fighting Uh, I'm Jonathan. 
mention. Um, you don't have to respond to that. You can just say that. Yeah, yeah. Any criticisms I might have had about the film were because I have kind of like a similar thought process of, with uh, aligning with Bella's thoughts about uh, Aslan. Uh, but other than that, um, the film was very informative. I wasn't aware of these Chicana martyrs. And also, this is like a very important time period when it comes to organizing, um, you know, uh, the 60s and 70s, where we have so much, uh, so much action going on. And I like that um, some of the points made in the film were that uh, people that were involved in the Chicano movement learned about liberation and self-determination through like uh, other like national liberation movements around the world, like in Cuba, Congo, Algeria. And I also like that they acknowledged that uh, they emulated the Black Panthers and Black, the Black Liberation Movement. And uh, I also found it interesting how uh, they supported the American Indian Movement through kind of like their own underground railroad kind of system. Uh, and also, I liked how the film ended on the note that, um, uh, you know, it is up to the it is up to the youth on continuing this legacy of organizing, and uh, because there is a generational difference, um, organizing doesn't always have to look the same. It always evolves to cater to whatever the needs of the communities are. Um, I like a lot of my different name ideas. Is, I'm sorry? My name is. Oh, my name is Ricky. Uh, a lot of different <laughs> ideas of the film talk about a lot of stories that I never heard before. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting was how like they just talked about how the Chicano movement saw a connection with like histories of borders and movements and how borders cross people and how that land means something to a lot of different people. Um, and just acknowledging that history and being able to compare its struggles through, you know, Cuba and other places, um, and just kind of like the revolutionary, like imagination of autonomy between all the different peoples and struggles at that time. Um, my name is Tamara. Um, I feel like I had a pretty similar reaction to the movie, just the way that people just spoke, and I thought it was. Um, I liked like learning about um, like again all of these different like figures that were in the Chicano movement who then like became martyrs and like um, seeing like a more like close up view of like this is what it was like like and like these are who these people were and like what they stood for and like, what they died for um, just like names that like I'm pretty sure I've heard before but like to get like to actually learn about them. Um, was really cool and like learning about like the movement specifically like in Colorado. Um, I think like I mean I have my own like thoughts about like you know this whole construction of, of, of Aslan which I don't like agree with but also like I think the um, perspective of this movie um, is kind of getting me to think about like even though like I don't like I have like my own criticisms of that Aslan and like what that whole thing means in terms of like nationalist ideology and like um, claiming that like this land like belongs to us just because like Mexico created that border in the first place. And then, uh, I mean, Mexico is a colonial state too. Like um, it's just in a different way and it's just not as powerful as the US and it's going through its own things. And like the US obviously like forcefully like moved that border back. Um, but that doesn't mean that like anyone from Mexico who has like a Mexican like ancestry or whatever doesn't really necessarily mean that like well you came from like California like you came from, you know like that or that it means it's necessarily your ancestral land but I really like the perspective of like well there there always has to be like I feel like the movie for me like I'm gonna walk away with the idea of like there's an evolution of thought and to get from one place you need to first come from another um and while like I the idea of Atsan, I feel like, is starting to fade away with this new generation. The idea of Atsan is what mobilized the previous generation, and like that identity of like indigeneity is what like moved the, the 
started to really move things forward. And now we're in the place where we are now, where we can take different steps. Um, and identity is changing too. So like, we had to come from somewhere to get to the movement that we are at now. Uh, my name is Carissa. Um, so I do work at Hope Moment Watch as a youth minister in Atlanta, Georgia. Could you uh, just keep your name? Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, I just and I agree with like a lot of the other things that people were making about like uh, how nationalism can be toxic, especially like when like the leaders of hierarchy that like exclude, um, you know, like different gender expressions um, or just like that binary. Like there was some consciousness raising like within like at academia or like that was utilized through academic institutions during this time and so like i know or like it's i kind of connected that to how they gave um credit for like the black panther party um and i don't know if like because my grandparents like during this time they're very anti-black so i don't know if that's because like they didn't have this um environment that they could go to where like they could uh, you know, learn about these things. Um, so like that's kind of this kind of motivated motivated me to like maybe ask questions. I'm Emily. Um, so I thought it was really interesting um, when one of the women, um, the activists, said that a lot of the women were um, like heavily involved in the fundraising movement. And I wish there would have been more on that because kind of obviously as a women in gender studies major, it doesn't really go straight to the standard analysis of it all. Um, but it, I connected it to another film I had watched recently um, about the Black Panther Party, um, and it was the first time in that film that I, in, in, a, in the film of the Black Panther Party, that I had heard um, different women in that organization talking about um, how the, the gender relations of the different activists at the time, um, and how women were um, like very active and had a very active role in the activism, yet like. Given as much credit as the, the strong men on the front uh, lines of it. Um, so I, I'm very inspired to go. Uh, I don't have really any history of uh, the Chicano movement, so I'm really excited to learn more about uh, the ways that women have a hand in that. Um, so. What are these kind of come up to you? Um, I'm Ashley. Are you going to continue? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I also agree with like kind of the narrative of us one problematic but I like how you pointed it out that it's like different like histories of thought like develop over time we were able to build on them and be critical of them um, from in retrospect um, but one of my favorite or like one of my some of the big points I liked is at the end where uh, Priscilla Falcon was talking about um, she said the, the unveiling happens when you believe in rights but you're denied these rights and I just think like this idea of attaining um, like European enlightenment ideals of like rights in general is like a really important thing to point to because it's a really limiting like trajectory to like attain for a liberation movement. Um, so I think like especially now people are realizing that your identity and subjectivity as a citizen doesn't really get you that far. So instead we should like take care of our communities and do harm reduction strategies in other ways that are not based on your relation to the state. I like that part. Um, my name is Tisali. Um, I don't actually know, I never um, like had an understanding of like the Chicano movement or anything like that. So I learned a lot from this. Um, you know, and I, I agree with the criticisms on um, Atsan. Um, but um, one thing I, did pick up on what I liked about was that uh, how the Chicano movement was sort of an accomplice to the American Indian movement and that they were arming them and that they were helping them move um, people who were wanted by the government. And I think that that was um, really nice to see. Um, and also just like it kind of brings up what we're seeing again where like we're seeing groups uh, arming themselves and I don't know, it just it's just um, connections to yeah, it's just something to like look for, I guess. Damn. Well, man, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. I, I don't know. I, 
I mean, I, I mean, this is the kind of stuff we always continue to talk about in Mecha, you know, about, you know, like Aslan and how we continue to critique it and, you know, based on pretty much whatever, <laughs> what all of you guys said, just like kind of, but, um, I don't know, coming back to like, I, like, I know they were talking about the Treaty of Hidal uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, and it just kind of like reminded me that like Mexico, Mexican government and the US government work hand in hand against like the Cherokee and like Apache, like indigenous folks that like live in that territory. And so I kind of wish they would have talked more about all these indigenous, like all these indigenous communities that were there before, like all of that was, um, you know, occupied by like, the, like, you know, like the Mexico state or like the US state. And then now we're going to have uh, the guest speak <coughs> and the uh, people who are here. Sergio Rogelio, we're going to get you. So my name is Rogelio, and um, I really like the, the the first parts, um, talking about um, like this oral history about how um, these traditions and th how this land was once ours, um, and th which also built this um, which I thought about um, Gloria Sandula with the Mestiza consciousness of um, being here, but not. So like what I'm hearing with this, um, with this critique of Aslan is um, like this tactic of divide and conquer. Um, you know, like, I, like the thing with, with racism, it always evolves and it always transform. And that's what we must do as well, address these issues that may have come, but also like, try to work to um, transform and unify um, us all together, right? Talk about passing dialogue and, and, and also, um, I also liked how um, they talked about um, Reyes. Um, Did you hear me? Yes, yes, uh, about how, um, it, like how these other people, um, I wanna say these, um, um, these people that had the, the pedestal of, of, of having a voice in this movement, but none of them touched the base on land. And once he touched the base on land, this um, capitalism and imperialism, and which is also connected with patriarchy, um, came into play. And um, where else can I go? Um, I also um, liked how um, like we as students have the responsibility to connect with the community and and make sure that we have some transparency. Um, also like how um, we must understand um, what's up to, like what are we putting up on the table and what we're like, might even sacrifice our own lives. And so I thought that was always key and understand that these are the tactics that they may use on us. And um, I also seen connections with the, um, that black liberation movement as well as the Black Lives Matter with police brutality and um, 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 un unmasking this um, police state that we live in, right? Um, also, um, Dewey's Junior Martinez, uh, I, I just like this um, concept and, and it goes back to tradition is of um, giving more than taking, right? of like taking, like just taking his shirt off his back and giving it to someone and, you know, just going the extra mile for, for the people. And, and uh, the reason why, you know, he was assassinated. Um, also, you know, um, also wanted to touch um, base on, on um, demands, students' demands that, I think also I, I wanted to bring up Gloria Sandula. We always wait to, um, to react instead of um, taking action before a reaction, right? So we always tend to um, react over like something the, the um, person um, in charge, like the president of the United States, we always tend to um, act on, on what he says, but what we must do, like prevent that, right? Address things before it becomes a problem. And I think we as students, we must be very vocal about that and, and um, you know, um, demand action and, um, you know, have um, things, our needs addressed. So like with the president um, of this um, inst um, institution, um, we must demand that they um, support ethnic studies because that's always
was the first on the chopping list, you know, cuts and and so we must have some transparency with with this uh, new election, I guess. And <laughs> maybe we we must demand a new building, right? Like I don't understand why we're connected with the psychology, although I do believe that um, trauma has affected us with the colonization, which kind of got to do with psych, but. I think we need our own building, our own departments, right? So, yeah. Mariana, if you don't speak in, but I'm asking if you guys want to say something. Um, I think there was, oh, also the, thank you. I did appreciate at the end them focusing on the youth, and I thought it was really interesting um, to note that they did focus on how things have progressed um, into the present day and how things have only gotten worse. Like, time doesn't mean that, you know, social change has happened or social progress hasn't happened. Time doesn't guarantee that. So um, I like that they emphasized educating um, the youth, getting entrenched with the community, um, because that's the only way that those things are going to actually come to fruition. Um, do you want to add um, I appreciated the acknowledgement of the arts in, in community building and unification, like spoken word and music, I think are very powerful vehicles of you know communication and getting things across and connecting with people. So I just thought that that was, I, I appreciated those snippets of creativity, my creative words in there. just like in this movement that is attached let's say to intelligentsia and um and there's other people that were working together in the community and so forth so it was like i had never i didn't even know who i knew was involved in trans kids movement because i benefited from that connecting with them obviously but i didn't was it's just to see the footage of him speaking and seeing him and his youth um you know like it's amazing i really appreciate that you know footage and and then to see the context of the conversations of the elders in the room that were super youth and alien and how the connection happened and so forth. So I really appreciated that he did it's a really hard story to tell. And um, and I think that um, it was a really great representation of what happened in that period of time and, and now I feel like I, I don't I would I wanna go back and just discuss it. I think okay, what kind of material can I bring into my class to understand resistance mm -hmm. and power? And um, and so I felt like it was a really good way to have a good discussion about what happened in that time and the power of student organizations, you know, and the strategies, you know, and also like what moved them, the snapshots, they did a good snapshot of student power and, and the need to communicate with community. And, um, and just like the, I really appreciate the humanism around the people that have been involved because whenever like they like they themselves were talking about how they they represented this group this activist radical you don't want to be part of group you know mm -hmm. um and yet like the richness of their commitment and, and and really get to the heart of like it's because you love your people and you understand systems and you understand oppression and you understand country con continuity and they realize their consciousness racing about um you know that, that how they were able to tap into that um, and, and holding the institutions accountable by saying, hey, you say this and you act this way and what's the difference? And then at the same time, really activating that by standing up to government over this way. Um, so I, I thought it was like a really good way of, of and then too, like the reliance about what happens when you're conscious and you know your history, you know, you, 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 you can, you get the people who never see bend down to want to negotiate with you, you know? Um, so I thought it was, um, I like the story.
story. I, I appreciate that you know, often you see these movements portrayed in isolated forms, like they have nothing to do with mm -hmm. each other, and are the concepts historically declined. But I really recognize that this, all movements interact with each other in context, you know? It's like radical, you know, radicals, people, they're, they're very people who care about people. Um, and, and I do appreciate too, because I don't think that there's often a clear uh, discussion or acceptance or recognizing in any of these movements, and we get nowhere, is that in who comes down to the land, you know, and who it belongs to. And I don't see Islam as saying that, and so this Islam is this belief that you can live in a land that feels like you're part of, you know, not separate from, regardless of what it is, and it never has been ours. And even with this, con yeah, and I don't know who, who doesn't belong to, I would say, from an indigenous perspective, everyone, you know, excluding no one. So the land doesn't belong to anybody. Exactly. Belong to you belong to the land, yes. Thank you for the correction, exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it was, um, I want to say I appreciate it. To me, it's just uh, a reaffirmation that, first of all, youth, young people, are the ones that move society forward. Uh, we were young. There was a lot of things that, as I think uh, uh, Priscilla was the one that said in the movie, I like that, uh, that analogy about the butterfly, how you metamorphosis, and all of us did. Many of us were, grew up uh, not knowing our history uh, at all, uh, and not even knowing our language. And then, you know, we get compelled and we get propelled uh, and make radical personal changes. Um, and, um, and it's a struggle. It's the struggle that pushes us forward, pushes society forward, pushes our community. And that's what the system wants to prevent. Because they know, uh, for example, I was a labor organizer and, uh, and in the normal course of things, the workers uh, digest and reflect uh, all of the, uh, the influence of society, but there comes moments like a strike where it brings forth issues and questions and uh, relationships, you know, and and, and, and crystallizes thinking that goes uh, and reaffirms uh, um, classes that in the normal course of time, uh, people don't think about. And that's the same thing, I think this documentary. Um, I think that uh, it also uh, is for, sometimes when we, uh, I know that uh, as an older person, sometimes I get a little frustrated because I think that, uh, and I keep reminding myself that each generation is different and <laughs> The other part about being young people is that we think we know it all. We dismiss our elders or we dismiss our history. Uh, we think that we're reinventing the wheel uh, or that we're, uh, so, so this documentary I think really shows how there's a history that, that connects to the present. Um, and that yes, each uh, context is different. Your generation is dealing with obviously a different phase of political dynamics, uh, and you will, of course, have to uh, come with to your own organizational framework and uh, uh, methods that maybe were different than ours. But I thought it was interesting also the documentary because it did show that there were different forms of struggle. There was the immediate land battle, which was one particular form. Then there was the development of the La Raza Unida Party, which was a different avenue, which also tried to so, uh, so that in all the struggles we come up with these, and then even the concepts, whether you know, uh, Aslan, you know, which I have to refresh my memory about that, <laughs> uh, or you know, deeper thinking theoretically, politically, those who uh, are, you know um, were influenced by political dynamics around the world, socialism, communism, revolutionary, imperialism. Uh, so these all shape us, and uh, I think that. Would, uh, it's a powerful, but, but most importantly, that there has to be struggle. I think that's what really is the impact, I think, from the documentary that, and the fact is that we have to remember the people who, who, who sacrificed, and all struggles have that. I'm, uh, I'm going to actually
to you just to say a few things about uh, my direction. And uh, also as somebody who, who, who has experience in uh, both Palestine studies, instructor of the course, but also in, in the history of Palestinian experience. So I was actually thinking about the various things that this film reminded me and, and brought to memory. One is the question of the martyrs and honoring the martyrs. And I think it's really, and, I, and there was um, something that really, really stuck to me is when uh, I don't remember who, but one of the women said, people die when they are killed and when me their memories are lost. I weep when memories are lost. And I think this is, this is really part of the whole uh, reason of actually thinking about why do we remember history? Why do we commemorate things? What's the purpose? We don't just commemorate them because we want, but it's actually, it's part of ourselves, it's part of our histories. And in the history of the Palestinian movement, there have been many, many people who have been assassinated. Every time a generation comes up, it's basically raised, you know, so. And it takes, as I said always, it takes a lot, long time to grow leaders. And leaders are assassinated. We, it takes, so that's one, one of the things. The other thing that I, so I, for me, that was really uh, very, very, um, um, very important. And as uh, Claude knows, and of course, Jaime, when we were in Palestine, there is a lot of honoring of martyrs. There is a lot of graves in the cemeteries and so on. And that is something that we've talked about many times. And it's, a, it's people who have been victimized, the fallen victims who've been victimized in massacres and so on. For such, we were talking about this, the, the, the Mexico student massacre 50 years ago today, but also the people who have been assassinated because they are leaders in order to deprive the movement of leaders of continuity and so on. So this is, uh, the other thing that I was thinking about is the land that, uh, the, and I'm actually, I'm not as, um, I'm not as allergic to the question of as a, a sultan or not, because uh, to me it didn't really seem as a big contradiction in the sense that it was an indigenous struggle, but I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen to all of you push me back and have discussion because I do believe in you know, indigenous rights and lands and so on, but I didn't see it that way. I just saw, I, and, I, and I think there is a whole thing about the whole history of the Americas in, in themselves, and especially in Latin America. And how do we think of Latin America as opposed to, let's say, Africa and Asia, or you know, where people came from and then there is the whole um, uh, uh, um, 1492 and the, 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 the colonization, and what does that mean? How do we think about it? How do we think about Latin American struggle today when people say we're not going to speak, we're going to kind of like push for <coughs> Spanish in Puerto Rico, for example, when people say we're going to push for the land, we're going to push against US imperialism and so on. When you are talking about a place where actually majority of the indigenous people have been decimated. So there is this kind of discussion that actually historically becomes really important in indigenous studies, indigenous lands. And so what do we think about that? So I, I, I do honor what you are saying, many of you, but I think also it's something that, I think it would be it's really important to have discussion. And I know it's very, it's a big tension between indigenous, indigen, indigenous communities and sometimes Chicano, Chicana, um, Mexican communities and so on about what's happening, what, what the manifest destiny and so on. I think it, um, it's something, and it's, the tension is there, and I'm not, I'm trying not to, uh, but for me, as somebody who is coming, uh, supporting all people's rights here, and all the uh, rights of, uh, it's, it's um, I, I would like to think about it some more. I think the whole question where there was the question <coughs> of why no Chicano studies and Chicano, Chicano studies, for me, it like rang so true about the whole question of Ahmed studies and what's going on, why do we need this, and why 50 years ago the whole strike took place. Uh, I like the connections of the international when they were saying worldwide movement. And actually, when we were in, uh, in, um, when we were in Denver, right? And we went, met with, uh, with some of the compañeros, compañeras in the film, and we actually attended the show, which is very different. This is like, I love the film. I think it's really amazing. And I want to have, have it shown in Palestine, and I want it shown in Arabic, and I want people to actually hear all these histories, as I want people here to hear about histories of struggle. They, we were told about the connection. We were told about the connection with the Palestinians without even prodding them. Just somebody jumped in, just like last week, the American Indian Movement. In 2008, Anthony Gonzalez of the American Indian Movement, we were sitting around the room commemorating the 40th anniversary of the strike. And, and we're talking about the older generation. He jumped in and said, oh, when I was in Beirut and I met Yasser Arafat, and I, 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 did, I did not know. He invited everybody to talk about the history and to pass it on to the younger people. But there is a lot of connections, and the same thing happened with Madonna Thunderhawk, 
um, about two years ago. So I think this is the whole, the connection existed. People connected with each other, met with each other, they exchanged experiences and so on. And this is how, the, and I think so the whole question of uh, the borders, creating the borders is, in, in, is a way to actually divide and, uh, and separate peoples. And then especially in the US, presenting it as, as anything that is outside is foreign and nothing inside is domestic, and everything inside is our own concern about communities of color, for example, and actually people don't even say indigenous communities, they're lumping these under communities of color. Everybody is here, and we should not really be concerned about things outside. And then people who are really marginalized and colonized end up buying, assimilating into this imperialist US settler colonial state that, that doesn't give anything, and because nobody can achieve whiteness, I mean, nobody, no matter how much people try, it doesn't work. Okay, people try, 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 and have tried, and we keep reading all these histories, but I think it's really important to kind of like think about this whole another separation of thinking about how the struggles uh, work with each other. I, when, when, when she said she could not recognize her son who was so beaten up, I think it was Martinez, right? Was it Martinez? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought, I thought here in this context about Emmett T. Hill, and I thought in the context of Palestine about Muhammad Abu Sayyaf who was burned, who was made to drink kerosene and burned to death. And his parents, we met his parents, or Baha and Lazy Emmett who, who was, yeah, I said Emmett Till, but I'm, I'm talking about like the context of these people here. Baha and Lazy whose whose body was kept in, in, the, in the freezer for many months. And they gave his body to his, kid, his family in a block of ice. And they forced them to bury him that way. I mean, this is the kind of the stuff, all the Palestinian prisoners who were captured by Israel, and they, they were alive when they were captured, and then they died in prison. They died out of beating up, and then the Israeli Supreme Court came out and said, a little oppression is okay to accept confession for the security of the status. So some of the stuff, it kind of like reminded me of uh, a lot of uh, um, the, um, I love the Underground Railroad uh, uh, discussion. I definitely thought a lot about the land, about Naqab, about Khan al-Ahmar now is getting destroyed, about some of the villages we met with, about the people in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem. I really liked the discussion about Vietnam and the how people refused to go and, 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 and participate in the, in the war in Vietnam. I have two issues that I thought students raised that maybe we can take. The, the, how to tell, the last thing that I say, how to tell our stories. I think how to tell our stories and how what, what mothers were saying, all of these. This is, I think it's really important. We need, we need to tell our stories. How do we tell our stories? To what end? What audiences? How do we use that? I thought there's two issues that you raised about the whole question of nationalism and gender that I want to also <coughs> have, to have more discussion around that. And what does that mean? Because I think that there is, there is a way um, in which um, nationalism, we study nationalism, all nationalism as being the same. And I think there are different nationalisms. And I think when we think about what is once was told about national liberation movement, it's not the same as the Nazism, it's not the same as fascist, uh, that, you know, the, uh, Spain or, um, or Italy or anywhere else. It's a very different way that is a reaction to kind of the colonization to respond to it. And within nationalism, and if nationalism, let's say I think about the Palestinian movement, if the movement is about the liberation and justice of people, it becomes a big contradiction between that movement trying to actually reproduce the same kind of structures of power and also mobilizing different people who are maybe half of the society to resist that structure of power. So in that process, there is actually a lot of spaces for kind of struggles and so on. So I think that is one thing. And the last thing is from about uh, the whole question about Mexico and how it was trying to present itself. And I was reminded about the strike in the sense that Mexico, right before the massacre, when the massacre took place 50 years ago, Mexico was trying to present itself as this modern, like modern nation that is not like other third world nations, that is fit to host the Olympics. The Olympics were going to happen and so on. And so I think the ways in which the construction of a nation state in the image of colonial nation state, of European nation state, what happens when we think about that for third world communities and marginalized communities? Lots on the table. <laughs> um, this is very cool. Um, I want to say just briefly how this film 
came about. Well, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add, even forgot to say thank you. Thank you. For, oh, you're I welcome. mean, I thank you're you welcome. for coming in, but thank you for making the film, and thank you for this. Amazing. So we made this film called COINTELPRO 101, which in very broad strokes tried to open up the question of um, U.S. counterinsurgency. Um, and, you know, it, it deals with only four of the major movements, but one of them was you know, the Chicano Mexicano struggle, which had never been connected to the history of state repression like the black liberation struggle, like indigenous struggle, like uh, the Puerto Rican independence movement. And um, even people who were scholars of state repression were saying, well, geez, we, you know, somebody like a Kathleen Cleaver, who's somebody that I know, after seeing Cohen Telpro said, you know, I never gave any thought the Chicano Mexicano struggle as being targeted by the US government in the same way. So this led us to wanna wanna expand on it. Um, and the thing is when you make a film, you you can only tell a limited story. It's different than an academic environment where all the questions are on the table. I appreciate the comments about Aslan. I would point out that only a couple people in the movie talk about Aslan because in fact the politics um, that we tried to represent in the film really span a lot of people, some of whom are actively part of the Democratic Party now. Some of them continue to identify as, and I'll use the term, revolutionary nationalists and anti-colonialists, whereas not everybody in that film would describe themselves and their own politics that way. And so, obviously, the, the, in, in, in my preparatory comment, I actually talked about, think about two waves of colonialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the first wave being European, and the second wave coming to occupy northern Mexico. So, it's complex, and the reason, you know, we consulted with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, for example, on how do we address the question about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which in some ways is represented as a progressive thing, but in fact was a cabal between the government of Mexico and the US, which the movie says, mm -hmm. directed to maintain a level of oppressive relationships towards indigenous peoples. And that's one aspect. And the second aspect that we don't go into very much in the film is the class aspect mm -hmm. and the purposefulness of the treaty in trying to create an hacendado class mm -hmm. as opposed to really <laughs> providing land to peasants and people who work the land. Which, I mean, this is very complex. You could make a whole documentary about just that. And somebody should. Um, so, I, you know, what I think is important is in, in all of your responses is what I l appreciate about it is it opens up these questions which I think have to be part of today's conversation because we can't really unpack all this, you know, centuries of history of oppression, uh, colonialism, uh, you know, in a 72 minute film, God knows. And even in one conversation, because it's so complicated. So I'm appreciative of how you responded to it for that reason alone. I think that, to me, that's very validating as somebody who's part of a collective who made this film. And, and in terms of the collective and how we work, um, uh, I'm from Argentina. One of the people is Chileno. One of them is uh, uh, African American. Um, uh, one is a young Chicana, and um, and one is a queer woman who we worked with for years, and we all kind of learned to negotiate how to tell a story in the course of this. Two of us have a lot of experience in media, 
myself being one for the for uh, my you know my close compañero who's Chileno and I've worked together since the early 70s. Everybody else, this is the first time they ever worked on a film, and the reason we feel like that's important is because of the cross generational, the strength of cross generational creativity lends itself to try to, you know, deepen the process of how do we represent story. Um, we were also very conscious of the fact that in researching this period, most of the stories were told by men. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that, in fact, <laughs> the majority, and in some ways, some of the most <coughs> profound, evocative material in the film is not coming from that's men true. at all. Yeah. Um, and that's intentional as well as the turning it over to new generations towards the end, but also the participatory aspect of it uh, with respect to culture and not separating the questions out. So, you know, trying to figure this out is complicated when you're trying to do it. Um, and you know, nothing's ever perfect or acceptable and we could talk for years about redoing things but then we would never do anything else. Um, so, some of my, you know, my response are of thankfulness for the kind of depth of your thinking and, and also to say, yes, we accomplished putting some very complex questions that you elucidated on the table. So that's, uh, you know, that's one thing. I think there's a lot of things to me that are questions that from, from my standpoint and my own history, you know, as somebody who's, who made choices to make sacrifices, um, you know, my own history is having done clandestine political work in the U.S. for 13 years and then doing prison time after that. Not about anything of my own particularly, but really as part of a collective process of trying to intersect with various struggles. In my case, black liberation, Puerto Rican independence. I was part of armed occupations on, on indigenous land before that. and. I was also, these some of these folks in this film are people that I've worked with, you know, for 40 years. And so that meant that they were willing to tell some stories and had some kind of basis of trust. And that the process of making the film involved them in the sense of asking them, are we representing your story so that you can feel mm -hmm. like you can pr represent it in the world, that we've been faithful, you know, to what you believe, to your life, to the sacrifices you've made, to your ideas as young people emerging in a period of time like this, which is so complicated. So, um, I mean, that's, it's a, to me, that's an important difference of being somebody involved in the creative process than just simply, I'm going to appropriate your story, walk away, and make a big hit. Um, and so, um, so the complicatedness is intentional, too, in that sense. So, you know, I mean, without telling you who's who, you know, some people talked about uh, you know, different tactics. Some people talked about different politics. Um, some people don't believe in national liberation, and some people do believe in the legitimacy of national liberation and committed their lives to that process and continue to do that. So, um, you know, easy answers aren't, are about trying to be dismissive of the challenges before us. Um, and so, you know, uh, things like this become a vehicle for all of us engaging, regardless of where we're at. And 
it's really, you know, those conversations are our only hope for moving forward. Um, you know, we're not all in the same place, and yet, look at how weak we are in relationship to the state, to the mobilization of the right, to the whole issue of white and male supremacy and how it functions globally, internally, you know, some of these things we can, you know, it doesn't matter if we believe in internal, internally colonized people or not under these circumstances, as long as we can figure out, you know, coming together on some fundamental human rights things and challenging a lot of the isms, right, the different aspects of oppression that we're faced with, which is different for all of us, um, you know, depending on gender or choices, or, binaries that may or may not exist for us, so we're challenging them, all that stuff. Um, so real, so real. And for the sake of also even answering to other people, when you come to Black Champion and ask questions, uh, you just said, based on what just on, on group, I think it's good that, that, you know, one of the takeaways is the importance to actually tell stories that have been invisibilized. And this is one of the things that sometimes they are intentionally, sometimes they're unintentionally. Sometimes who gets to tell the story, sometimes who becomes who, who gets access to people to ask questions, sometimes what are the stakes. There is multiple things to think about. And we have the luxury of being in a classroom where we can actually look at the film as a text, read the film and analyze it as a text, and look at it and think about well, how does it uh, compare with other things. I think also is the question of where the stories are told. And this is as I mentioned in the beginning, this is part of teaching Palestine pedagogical practice and the invisibility of justice. And one of the things we say that we can tell the stories everywhere. I mean, when we were in Palestine, people kept saying the prison is a university. The prison is a university. The prison is a university. It is. I mean, it is. And you learn everywhere. You can discuss on the streets and so on. It's part of. It's part of the. Um, it's part of. It's part of raising consciousness, learning, being critical. Okay, and then takes me to the whole question of also what you are saying, the respect. And the respect and the ways we are taking care when we tell other people's stories. Be they continue to be their stories. They never become ours. We do not own the stories. So one of the things that we were in a methodology, met methodology class, and you were collecting oral histories, I always say that if a person you're interviewing says, turn off the tape and delete, you turn off the tape and delete. I don't care how much time you've gathered, how much scoop you have, how much uh, your career is invested in it. It's their story, especially when you are talking to people in marginalized communities. It doesn't become yours. It's not about the scoop and building careers and so on. And not many people do it, but it's really, 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 really important if you are thinking about doing scholarship and building a movement. If you are only, you want to only push your own career, that's a different place. That's not the project we're talking about. That's not the project of justice. That's something else, okay? that's. And I think sometimes people need, want to pass off what they are doing for their own careers as if they are doing a separate for the movement, but it's not. You can try, it doesn't really work. Maybe we don't say what it is now, but maybe 10 years down the line, we name names, okay? And, okay. and I think then it becomes a question of responsibility of the community and accountability. So why do we tell these stories? What does, what does this do to the people who hear the story? And what does it mean for all of us here today at San Francisco State, 50 years after this drive, people who struggled then, in order for them to create the space that we're in, we're able to have these classes, we're able to have these discussions because of that. So what does it mean, and what does it mean for the people who have already sacrificed? And the people who sacrificed, they sacrificed. But not restoring, we're not restoring their <coughs> lives, we're restoring their losses, we're not restoring their livelihood. The only thing I believe we can do is basically they honor them by continuing to actually struggle for the questions of justice. So I mean, I may sound like a broken record, and may sound, but I, I really, I mean, I really believe in that. That's why I think we need to study relevant topics and so on. I'm going to turn it to Alex, and I'm going to go around and see people have questions, comments, and so on until the class is over. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. This is for Claude. I was just curious, um, what, and may I ask, like, what specific organizations you were part of? For back in the day, we can tell them about your sheet anyway. It's already there. So no, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, or movements. 
I was charged with stuff around trying to break Oscar Lopez Rivera, a Puerto Rican independence fighter out of prison mm. on a conspiracy charge. That's, that's what I was charged with. Okay. And um, yeah, I'll say that. And there is a connection to us because when, when, when uh, Oscar Lopez Rivera was freed and came to the Bay Area, mm. the Zionist groups have been attacking us left and right and attacking me left and Oh, and she took all these former prisoners to Palestine and so on and so on. I mean, they try to be the smear and so on, and everything is public knowledge. I mean, it's not just with actually hiding and everything is out there. So. Anyway, the question of organization, I won't answer it directly. I mean, I was, I, I was part of a collective of people who were struggling in solidarity with a bunch of movements over a long period of time. And those are the specifics that I ended up doing time behind. Uh, I did four years after uh, surfacing in the, in the end of um, I think something that we also need to um, work on is this, um, in 1968, right, it's like a worldwide movement. It wasn't only in the um, Americas, but Mexico, and then Vietnam. So I feel like we, we need to build, uh, and this is all from like speeches from Malcolm X, like we need to build a new type of language, a new type of communication with people to have that dialogue and, and understand that we all have different struggles. And once we, we could all come with that uh, understanding that, um, you know, that we're oppressed and, and we could start working to, to figure out some type of liberation. So um, that's, I just feel that we gotta work with transparency and, and have that dialogue. Um, you know, like he also says, um, like we could talk in the, in the closet, but once we come out to the street, we're in solidarity, right? We don't have those problems, but if we must, we could talk about it and dialogue and come to agreement. So um, that's why I wanted to point out that we need to have a new uh, 1968 um, type of movement um, with solidarity, um, worldwide solidarity um, with, with the people. And by the way, there's also Senegal, Tunisia, and France, it doesn't really, it's just everybody only thinks about this. Because they love the same <laughs> aesthetic. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks only about the Vietnamese, but it lasts the world. It was worldwide. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why Vietnam isn't hot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the war that the U.S. lost. And what are the lessons of that? You know, how did they actually accomplish what they did? What forms of organization did it take to drive the most powerful country out of a small territory of a, the land of Vietnam. What, you know, if, if we were to study that, we would learn something significant and talk about erasure. Um, what we talk about a lot um, in our organization, in the Freedom Archives, is how do we represent subjugated history? of things that aren't going to be in a textbook. So when we take a film into a high school, for example, you know, where there's even a less developed intellectual process, it's very mind-blowing. Or when we have interns from high schools work with us, people who, like, for the first time in their lives are starting to think differently to me, that does uh, validates the potential that we have to really overcome the kind of conditions that are imposed by capitalism and imperialism in the world. So, you seem like you could just say something. No, it's it's great. It's great to have this conversation. I think, I think you're right. That that's what's great about the movie is that it allows for conversation about these matters and to. Uh, 
address your, your point. I wonder what you really said, but like the point of like, yeah, it, I mean, it, it is about just being, one of the things that they said is like, we studied and we organized, we studied, like mm -hmm. we acted and we studied and we acted and we studied, like it's not divorced from a consciousness. And I think the more we, you know, like I think studies are so young, 50 years, you know, and it's amazing how much it has been accomplished in that short of period of time. And when I talk to people who, who were, have been involved in that, it's because we did just that and we worked together, you know. So I think more and more we'll see that these are have always been interconnected because the consciousness is that there is a, a state, that there is repressive, that there's this um, coercive power, that the state has legitimacy or the monopoly and legitimacy of violence, mm -hmm. that there's persuasive power, that there's these ideology, ideologies, and it's about taking note that that that's repetitive, so we'll see that even today, that's that's why it's like about how do you organize in this globalized society, and it, and it really is a network of power, and also that it has to be a network of resistance, the resistance has to have this counter power. There, I think that's what we see here, you know, they get another example, and they continue, and I was like, you know, like what really struck me was when they were talking about, when they use that many movement, like La Causa, like there's a cause, you know? And, um, and when he said, I belong to that, to that, to the universe, you know, it didn't belong to me, it's like there's this cause, and then the, and the more we lean to it, it's like we have to constantly move and move and lift, you know? So at some point you become conscious of what position do you take, you know, like I said, there's two choices, you either belong to the rugby, <laughs> or you fight back, you know? And that's kind of like, you know, I think it, in the end it kind of comes to kind of like, just like, uh, but how much do you know, you know, because once you know, it's like taking having a baby come out of the womb, you can't take it back. <laughs> you know? And um, and then also, so yeah, it is about understanding what are the, the strategies you have to be connected, you have to be conscious, you have to work together, and these things are not separate from, just like any movement today is not separate from each other, because the consciousness is that there's uh, power and counter power, and then, and then the point is what strategies work. I, I would feel if you had to have a question of um, gender, we only touched upon it briefly. Would you want to kind of like expand a little bit on? I mean, what we all discussed about the thing you said, but there is much more. So, would you, if you have any questions you want to talk about? I didn't have any specific mm -hmm. questions per se. Mm -hmm. um, just inspired me definitely to go look in books and do more research on the, the, the specific thing. I did have a question though. Um, you mentioned the Co and Telco film that you are mm -hmm. working I know it's if being not, shown in, a, in at least two classes here coming up before this semester is over. Uh, but you can go to our website too. It's, it's, it's worth. It's really worth. Um, it's really, really, I highly recommend it. Oh, yeah, like I was just want to say that the scare tactics that are used, you know, to terrify people, you know, like that's when you yeah. see the state. So, <clears throat> I might sound crazy, but um, so like all these social movements in the 60s and the 70s really focused on, you know, being a part and getting involved and being a part of these institutions and having a voice and being on the scene. Um, and I just, I don't know, I feel like it's taken away the autonomy of like our learning experience and how these institutions kind of commodify um, each and one of us. And so it might be more concrete, so if you understand. So like just saying like, I think so too. you know, like we become part of the institution and we become in debt and what we're here for is to get, you know, a, a grade and a letter and then go out into the world and it's like that same cycle all over again. Like, I I don't know, I'm just like thinking because they brought up like the Zapatistas and you know, like they've created their own space, like they don't, they're a society that's like constantly moving, you know, it's like they don't want to be a part of the state. They want to create their own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but like, <laughs> 
But like, you know, I just, I don't know. I feel like we were so restricted in this institution and it's like, it's so hard to like want to be, want to be here and continue giving to, to this, to this, you know, like we, what, what I'm kind of like a question I'm posing is like, is there any way to create an autonomous learning space is what I'm asking. Yeah. And it's like, we yes. are, we, yeah, but like, I mean, the answer, the, you know, the, the, the academy is the mechanism that justifies inequalities, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go through this, and so they're going to teach you to, it, 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 it's like it legit, legitimate you, but it's also for you to produce, you know, the system that we have, which is the capitalist society. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's why, but I think studies is, 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 that's why they're so opposing, and that's why there's such a rejection to these mm -hmm. kinds of studies, because um, because it's, it's giving you not the dominant hegemonic narrative, it's competing with you, you know, it's telling, actually talking about things that are true, so different, from a different yeah. point of view, from like uh, the racialized people, the oppressed people, you know what I mean? It's, it's, that's why it's dangerous, right? Because you see that, you see that in the film, and people realize there was a marginalized groups like cooperatives and like just like um like prison so like prison networks and stuff and just like small things like i feel uh like sometimes i feel like really sad because i think the same thing i'm like i'm going to the school and like you know like what I, like what does this mean now you know like but um there's like i don't know i just try to exert like small like what i can like um like the big prison strike that happened like in august or september 9th um, there's like so the prisoners are like facing oppression so like if there's like small ways we can like you know again it's appealing to senators but at the same time like some people are like you know really being like in prison specifically where they're like it have no like rights or whatever like I don't know my, <laughs> my answer is like it seems hard to navigate but there are a lot of I think it's harder to re recognize in this context of the United States and I don't think that it would be possible in the same way because they're completely different, like, they're not comparable at all, like, indigenous, like, you know, like, they have had their own, like, traditions and communal, like, ways of things that we're totally, like, poisoned by that would not really be possible, but, um, on, like, that scale, but, I yeah. think it's a lot of different things. Oh, sorry. But I think, um, Bella is speaking about the ways in which it's, she was speaking, she was pretty much here about the university and how yeah, the and university how is basically yeah. oh, producing. Okay, sorry. It's producing. I mean, the function of education is to produce citizens who are docile, who are going to go out in the world and basically mm -hmm. reproduce the system. Mm -hmm. And so when students organize, when students become active, whether it is 1968 or today or whatever, it's not supposed to be. It is not, it is not designed for that. So you are breaking the mold by saying we're going to do this. We are breaking the mold by having discussions <coughs> like this. When people do that, it is not 
Sometimes it is used in a way that becomes uh, sort of like this multi-country diversity thing. Oh, look, we have this, we have this, and we have the people who are living here, we have these people who are doing this, and so on. And so it becomes sort of like a diversity um, um, marketing device, right? Mm -hmm. And so on, and San Francisco State is really good at that. Yeah. It does this all the time, and just brings a few, you know, uh, people to say, look, oh, we're really diverse and so on, but look at the top. I mean, even the top person who's a person of color mm -hmm. who has done everything that the institution has done has to step down. So I'm not going to continue over there, but I mean, this is, and I think there is a way also in which a lot of the times, what do we do then with the education we get? And when we begin uh, having an, a radical experiment and so on, how radical does it continue, or does it find a way to accommodate itself with the system? Meanwhile, it retains the title of being radical and so on. So I think this is a question today, 50 years after uh, the strike of 1968, when we're at. I think we really need to assess, I mean, by comparison with, quote unquote, the classics and the ways in which the right wing and the white supremacists and, and the Zionists are actually trying to make us only study one part of knowledge, not as all the knowledge, Definitely we're doing really great in, in classes of ethnic studies. I don't think we're doing enough. I don't think we are doing enough. I think there is a lot of sort of like um, adapting to the system because it gets comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is that how do we retain that radical edge that actually allows the students to open up and challenge and, and, and as faculty provide that kind of a cushion for you when you are organizing it. And so that's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, we had to put that proclaim in our syllabi mm -hmm. two years ago about uh, uh, not allowing ICE to come into the classrooms and not allowing students to be arrested, not allowing students to show their IDs and so on. And it's easier to set on paper than uh, in practice because you have to put your body on the line for the students. And so it's much harder when you have a system with police carrying tasers. With, it's much, much, much harder to, and I think this is kind of the first question that Okay. Not only that, but no, just like on. how uh, yeah, other students. Yeah, go ahead. But just yeah, like how education, like even that whole idea of education, like everyone's always constantly learning. Like I don't feel like we need this institution to like over educate yeah. it now. Like, you just you know yeah, classes. everyone's Literally. learning. We're always learning like, oral histories, everything. Jonathan, and then and Claude gets the last word. Yeah. Tamara. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, it, 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 it doesn't really like answer your question, <laughs> but I feel like an, an add-on to that is like, I feel like part of the problem is that there's a very big disillusionment with not only this institution, but all higher education systems where like, it's very different than what was going on in the 60s. And like, there was more of like a more straightforward, like if you can get into college, um, and once you pass that first barrier, it's supposed to be in a straightforward line of, graduate college, get a degree, and that ensures you a future where you can go back to your community and help, where that really isn't that true anymore. Like, mm -hmm. getting a degree is like, in a lot of ways, like kind of like, it's kind of useless because it doesn't guarantee you anything. It still has way more to do about like luck and who you know and all of these other things. So like, there's like, a, I feel like there's a very big like frustration among like all students of like, we really don't know why we're here. Um, to begin with, so there's already that animosity of like, it, like part of you already feels like you're doing something pointless and you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of stress and giving away a lot of your health and a lot of your years for something that like you know isn't going to like pay off for all of the work that you're like putting into it. So I think it really allows, at least for like people who are into organizing to question um, the institution even more and to be like very critical of it, of like, um, this is already not serving me for what it says that it will. So I'm going to like <laughs> demand, I like my expectations for it are higher. I'm going to demand like as much as I can from this institution because I need to get at least something. And I think right now like that need just isn't being met. Um, so not only are we getting a degree that isn't going to like ensure us like the future that is being promised by it, um, but what we are learning doesn't feel like enough um, to handle like what we want out of like the system and like um, so we're not even getting the education that like we need nevertheless like the credentials that will like move us forward and that's like another big part of like the problem 
of just where you live together. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. um, well, when it comes to this institution, and like, yeah, Epic Studies has pushed back, which is why the university doesn't like want to fund it or expand it. But even within uh, building these spaces, we have to be cautious of constructing new hegemonies, which is very prominent, like for me and like my experiences in a lot of uh, quote unquote Latinx spaces, in that they tend they do tend to like center the voices of like me of men, they do tend to center the voices of people who are who would identify as Mexican or Chicano. They do, tend, they do tend to uh, center the voices of those who would like be white Latinx or mestizo. Um, and with that, it does become extremely frustrating, especially if you have this idea, if you come, you come in with like this idea that this is supposed to be like a space that you're supposed to be comfortable in, and you're supposed to, uh, like, you know, your liberation is rooted within these spaces. Like for example, here in San Francisco, um, well not only in San Francisco, but like around the nation when it comes to this recent uh, conversation about uh, family separations, uh, not hardly anyone wants to acknowledge that a majority of these kids that are separated from their families aren't coming from Mexico. The Mexican government has said themselves only about 1% of those children are from Mexico. They're coming from Central America, specifically the countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, where the United States has played an active hand in just in so many in so many ways. My own family comes from El Salvador, and how within like these Latinx spaces, we're not centering like these voices of how the U these <coughs> narratives of how the U.S. has treated Central America and the Caribbean as its own backyard, it's implemented dictatorships, it's responsible for these civil wars, for death squads, you know, that like a battalion which murdered over 800 people in the uh, village of El Mosote, not that far from where my mom was born in El Salvador. The Tukumaku, which was established by uh, the Duvalis in Haiti. And yeah, it's, it's increasingly frustrating, like within these spaces we should, center the voices of not only just like people that come from like these areas that have faced the repercussions of US imperialism, but also like community uh, members of, the, of these communities that have been affected through by settlement, by anti-blackness, by femicides. Um, there are plenty of indigenous communities and plenty of black communities all throughout Latin America. Like, you know, so much, like I appreciate uh, the voices of women being centered in this film because we put so much labor upon women and femmes, and a lot of times they aren't acknowledged for <coughs> it. Yeah. Um, Unless somebody has a hand. Yeah. Okay. I have three <coughs> seconds. Okay, I wanted to talk about, yeah, we, we do have this problem with this, um, with, um, this education system, right? Um, so I believe, um, Pablo Fede um, touched basis on that with the empty model um, with us being like an uh, empty vessel. And I think it comes back to indigenous ways of, of um, valuing what we bring to the table, what our parents, what our people pass down to us. And once the, the institution and people in power could respect that, we could, you know, have a, a say and, you know, be able to grow. So decolonization is, is key, you know. The mind, it starts with the individual. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I don't think we we should mythologize the sixties and seventies. I chose to drop out of school in nineteen seventy one because I thought it despite what we were winning, despite San Francisco State, third world struggle that I was a part of in Cal, there was so much bullshit. It, you know, it's like, yeah, it's worse, but fundamentally the institution is a construct that supports the structural nature of what we're a part of. However, I think the mistake is to become anti-intellectual. 
because in fact, that's what, that's how we defeat this, is by, you know, <coughs> hanging on to the history, handing on to the cultural integrity, exposing, you know, the level of, um, you know, violence and brutality that's inherent in the structural being. And we have to study it. We have to study it to understand how to dismantle it. It's not just, you know, we aren't going to do it by being just strictly insurrectionary. We have to organize ourselves. And um, so, I mean, there's many examples of that. Um, and some of them are a part of history, and some of that resistance is yet incomplete. So in, in 2013, in California, when 30,000 prisoners took action in the same day because of human rights demands, that was not a spontaneous act. That was a product of years of organizing work under the most, under the most oppressive conditions you can imagine, particularly people in isolation solitary confinement. So I mention that because the brilliance mm -hmm. of, an, of the ability for people who don't have high degrees, for the most part, to figure out a way to bring themselves together, um, one, of which, one of the key elements of that was an agreement and hostilities to resolve internal contradictions among them, among the sects, in order to amass themselves in opposition to the people that held the keys to their cages. And they didn't win militarily, but they won politically. They won intellectually. They won because people were, were ready to put their lives on the line to do it. Now, you know, that's not unique historically, although it's pretty unique in terms of prison struggle. Um, the other example of a similar thing, and I, I talk about it, I want to frame it in terms of prison because one, it's part of my experience, but I think when you look at the unity and the lessons of a place like Palestine, where there's a tremendous amount of disunity in the street and yet within the prisons, there's a high level of unity and political leadership from within is far more profound in some ways. I don't think exclusively, but. So in, in February of 1970, at Folsom Prison in California, um, 2,400 prisoners refused to leave their cells for 19 days. Nobody knows that that happened. And what they issued was called the Folsom Manifesto. And it's the precursor to Attica, and it's the precursor to a lot of what we're seeing now. And we fail to connect and to see the continuity of that. And mind you, in 1970, there was about a quarter of a million people locked up in the United States, whereas now there's 2.4 million, or give or take. An act like that and a period like that in the same state as, as this massive strike that happened in 2013, that has to make us think and wake up and rethink what the potential, what, what is the human potential under the most oppressive circumstances. And, you know, that to me is, if, if they can figure that out, we can figure out how to throttle some of the bullshit in an institution like this. And we can't do it by accepting the commodification of the degree or the career or any of that stuff. And yet, it, it can be a liberatory space. You know, it's a dialectic. It, it, it is both, but we have to fight for the part of that that leads to liberatory thinking and action. And so what the privilege of being in an institution like this, how does that get reflected in the communities that we come from? You know, why did the Black Panther Party not only publish their paper, but use it to teach literacy? Not just 
reading, but political literacy. What was the lesson of that? And how do we start to think about the relationship of complicated ideas um, reflecting on a different set of truths and the model that takes it back into the community to bring other people along who can never afford the debt involved with coming to San Francisco State or any other higher institution. Even community college, except for, I guess, some of them that are now free, which is cool, but, you know, these are some of the things that I think we still have to fight for this, even if we hate it, you know? Even if we see how problematic it is, and the people who run it, they're not gonna be cajoled into becoming better people, you know? The US government will not reach a moral epiphany and change its mind about being in power. It got there through force of arms, it's gonna maintain, their, maintain the power through force of arms. We have to think differently about, in the long run, what is our vision and how do we get there? We can use the tools that we get in a place like this in different ways. We can turn it on them. But that's, we have to be thinking like that or it's not gonna happen. You know, um, I got a, a bachelor's degree when I was in prison, it meant nothing. I can still drive for Lyft if I choose to, but you know, <laughs> the main stigma is having a record. And so many people in so many of the most marginalized communities are faced with that kind of contradiction. And so the structural way of dealing with it has to be inclusive of those kinds of people who don't have access. Um, and that, that's kind of my, you know, it's like, I love it here. I love conversations like this. I don't know what I would do if I were you. I don't, because I don't think I can stand it. On the other hand, I can, and I'm happy to be in a place like this, so. With that note, tomorrow, tomorrow we are having four of the striking members of 1968 coming here at 7 p.m. in the class, and they are going to actually have discussion about what happened and prepare your questions to ask them what did you do then, but ask really concrete <coughs> questions, so please join us. It's continuing discussing oral histories and continuing to pass on the experiences, and I really want to thank on everybody's behalf. First, thank you all for being here. Uh, well, it's really don't have a choice, but. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get your credit. And thank you, and thank you people who are coming in the class. Thank you everybody online, and definitely, definitely Thank you, Claude, and the team of different symbols of resistance and the Korean archives that continue to preserve, tell the story, pass on the story, and give us a lot of grants for critical knowledge so we can produce <coughs> knowledge for justice.